believe it or not, the United States was a third world country 150 years, a little bit less or more ago. The changes to property law in the United States left the rest of the world behind. They were tremendous. They gave everybody an incentive to move ahead. The road to prosperity started with the rise of individual property rights and the rule of law in the Western world, especially in the United States. The history of success in the United States is to a great degree the history of the evolution of property law. Before we had property, what there was was feudalism. It was kings and queens. A few people had all of the assets in their hands, legal title to it. By people rebelling against privilege in the United States, you created a system of law where everybody could have a stake in the game. And that's what allowed all Americans to have the opportunity to be entrepreneurs and created today's prosperity. This system of law began long ago as common people gained access to more and more rights. Today, it is still possible to see how the law develops from the customs of ordinary people. Africa, the birthplace of humanity. Here, among some of the poorest nations on Earth, Hernando de Soto discovers a window into the process of how local practices become the basis of the rule of law. On the broad Serengeti plain linking Kenya and Tanzania, the Maasai live as they have for generations. At the center of their society are their cattle. A Maasai's cattle are more than simply a food source. They are the source of his wealth. Each morning, young boys lead their livestock to pasture. From sunrise to sunset, these child shepherds are in charge of their family's major possession. Nomadic people are not riding all the time or walking all the time. They stop. They reside in different places. The fact that they don't reside in one place doesn't mean that they don't consider that they've got ownership over things or rights over things, like the right to use a road. The Maasai live in extended family groups inside a circular compound, or boma. Hernando de Soto has found that every society, including the tribal Maasai, has a concept of private property and ownership. We have also not found one cow or one bull that isn't branded with a symbol that indicates that its identity belongs to someone in particular. While their land is held in common, each tribal member has firm and established rights to live, graze livestock, and to use the water and salt licks on the land. What there always is among humans, unfortunately, are conflicts. Conflicts are usually about things that they own or they think they own. Historically, the Maasai have had no written law. They have relied on oral communications. When a Maasai has a dispute, he summons an elder, or Laiguanani, like Luishe Moye. A Laiguanani can resolve a variety of disputes, such as quarrels over inheritances, dishonorable behavior, and most importantly, disputes about property. They resolve, in the broad majority of cases, all their conflicts through adjudications that are legitimate and accepted at each village level. So they already have an adjudication system. This is Wamasai. Sheria ya Mila na Desuri ya Wamasai. This is because the Maasai legal system springs from the people. It reflects their core values and their beliefs. It is the people's law. The law is something that's spontaneous. We have thought that the law is the product of legislatures, but in fact, 
the law is the product of good habits, good customs that people accept, and that continually incorporate people's real dealings with each other into the law. Eh, inatakiwa sasa hivi zile sheria za kimasai ambazo zinasuluhisha migogoro bila kufika mahakamani na bila kutumia gharama kubwa na mtu anapata haki. The majority of citizens in the world all want order. It's a natural human trait. They've created their own law. <laughs> Rick Ambinga is a Mwenyakiti, the elected chairman of his village government in the Kinzudi Goba area of Tanzania. Uh -huh. So they're changing their customs too. Yes. They're evolving. Rick has long conducted village business, including the transfer of property. In the recent past, property transfers were executed orally. They bring in members of the community who are actually neighbors and therefore know the area where the selling is taking place and create in a small ceremony the public memory that certifies that a transaction took place. But this public ceremony is very different. This Mwenyakiti has made a significant change. He's created the first standard form within this village of 4,000 to 5,000 people so that everybody actually takes away a symbol, a representation of the act. Historically, all legal documents began as speech. Is this a typical document or have you created a special I'm document? The one who created it. You created the deed. Yes. yes. The record system was already in place, but you created the deed. Yeah. Well, this is the first time that there is actually a certification of somebody being owner. The seller himself never had this. So this is the beginning of the law. That's very interesting. Yeah. That's the beginning of the law. Right? He is at the genesis of the property system in this country. It's the first time that they're going from a speech act when they transfer a good to actually a document act. The creation of these documents is an important step forward. All over the third world, people are creating documents like these to record a variety of transactions, to establish property rights, to protect their assets, and to connect themselves to expanded markets outside their village and eventually with national and global markets. Custom is not enough. If you're going to have non-customary people coming into your territory and if you're going to be migrating. You need law. The legal framework for property and business that is evolving today across the developing world began in the West just a few centuries ago, and the result was dramatic. It led directly to the greatest period of economic growth in world history. Starting in the late 16th century, Europe began to experience a revolutionary shift in power. It would have a profound effect on the law. For centuries, from their hilltop castles, nobles had owned all below them. This castle represents power as it was in Europe even up to 200 years ago. A few people, the nobility, decided how things were governed. That's where the laws came from. That's where the taxing power came from. That's where all control came from. Then, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Europe was inundated by uncontrollable migration, overwhelming poverty, and massive social unrest. Europe was, as Marx described it, one big rural slum less than 150 years ago. It was a brutish life, according to Hobbes. It's a situation similar to what you get in third world countries today. But the old order and economic structure were breaking down. Millions left their homes to travel the world in search of opportunities in the emerging markets of the day. They needed now to be able to constitute businesses of their own. And so the law was forced to recognize those rights. And the law was forced to recognize that if they bought and they sold and they created, they had to dispose of their assets. And so the law was forced to become flexible 
and allow them to hold property rights. For the first time, common people were free to own property and create enterprises of their own. This was a fundamental turning point for mankind. Before, only a few people could own things, only a few people could authorize business. Power shifted from the castles on the hilltop to the villages and the people below. The shift of power to a growing middle class did not benefit everyone. Civilization had leapt forward, but there was still far to go. Two powerful engines would fuel the fantastic growth of the 19th and 20th centuries. The first occurred when the common man secured the right to own property. For most of human history, less than 3% of humanity had owned almost all of the world's land. That was about to change. De Soto views the American experience from his own perspective. Believe it or not, the United States was a third world country. 150 years, a little bit less or more ago. Uh, it was a country where there was disorder, there was lawlessness. Um, there were migrants coming in from Europe. There were people fighting for land. There were gangs in New York, you know, right along these streets, uh, stealing, fighting with each other, uh, not being able to settle things peacefully the way you can today in the West. America was built by people searching for a better future, and they started off in slums, in workshops, and sweatshops, and built it into what it was today. Our origins are the same. We third worlders would have felt quite at home in the Montana settlements, in the gold rush of California, and even in the Lower East Side of Manhattan just 100 years ago. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Lower East Side of New York had become the most densely populated place on Earth. Thousands of immigrants clustered together to create business opportunities, just as third world migrants are doing today. Living in small, crowded apartments, their homes were also their workplaces. This is the very small apartment made up of three tiny rooms where the Levine family lived in 1897. They were Russian Jewish immigrants, and they lived here with their two children. And in this three-room apartment, they also worked with three employees. The Levine home has been recreated as part of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in Manhattan. It was one of thousands of workshops lining the streets of the Lower East Side. People came here in the Lower East Side of Manhattan for the same reason they now flock to urban areas in developing countries. Jobs, a better life for themselves and their family. To the immigrants who had never owned land, the vast, empty spaces of the American West were an irresistible attraction. By the thousands, they went west. Most were young and strong, Taming a wilderness was not for the weak. Farmers, ranchers, and miners all competed for land. Very few held legal title. The settling of the American West was a dirty, violent, and for many, deadly adventure. When you were a kid, when I was a kid, and even now when there's some old reruns on television, we see uh, Wild West films. And in those Wild West films, we see ranchers fighting against farmers, then you find their fights between indigenous Americans and migrants that have come in from uh, Europe. All right, you do. Get him up. Come on. Get him up. Get over there. Not everybody agreed, not only on who owned what among farmers or who had the right to graze uh, here or there among ranchers, but literally between the farmers and the ranchers. The whole idea of the 18th and 19th century United States is fraught with all of these romantic films with violence, but it was really a fight to find out how they could live together eventually without fighting, because it caused a lot of deaths and it caused, of course, a lot of misery. Through most of the 19th century, the squatters were a hated presence on the frontier, as they are in many parts of the world today. But in America, squatters ultimately became legitimate landowners, 
and how that happened defined property law in the New Republic. They couldn't actually do good maps, representations that are faithful to the actual uh, border lines of where they live or where they work. So they had to use physical manifestations, symbols, to establish rights. So in certain areas of the United States, they had tomahawk rights, which meant those areas where you shaved off uh, part of a tree, probably somebody else shaved part of the same tree to indicate that they had accepted it. Uh, in some cases where they grew corn, for example, the corn grew from here to there, and that established a right from here to there. So those were actually called corn rights. It was an improvement on the land that uh, gave you the title to it because you had worked it. And then afterwards, of course, you cut the trees down to build cabins. It was an improvement. And so on the basis of that, cabin rights were also created. The West was settled as people claimed land, created towns, and registered deeds in local land offices. People decided that there was enough of a consensus to write all of this up and create a more abstract order based on maps, clear coordinates, and longitude lines. But it all started with tomahawks, with corn, and with cabins. The inalienable rights guaranteed by the founding fathers in the American Constitution had set great changes in motion. They were, in their time, the people that flipped the notion of who owned the world. No longer were the squatters scruffy criminals, but noble pioneers transforming a wilderness. It all starts off with squatters who want to live in peace. First come the people, then comes the property, and then comes the rule of law. And so America's first great engine of growth was the extension of property ownership to the common man. The second was the modern business organization, which in time became the foundation of globalization. Turning water into steam unlocks a powerful new force. It's much the same with capital. Transforming business laws and systems unlocks the productive potential in capital and creates great wealth. America's railroads are a prime example. In the early 1800s, European and American businesses were largely organized as family enterprises or partnerships. Families were too small to organize large-scale business. You had to accumulate the value of many families put together. The development of the railroads in the United States required huge amounts of capital. The Industrial Revolution was really also a commercial revolution. The Industrial Revolution would not have been possible without the corporation. It was once impossible to form a corporation without a special legislative act. When that changed, the railroads conquered the continent. The common man now commanded more powerful industrial and financial tools than ever before. In less than 100 years, private property ownership and the creation of the modern company had launched America on the fast track to prosperity. Constitutional revolutions that shaped the West continue to resonate around the globe. And history shows us that when ordinary people gain access to property rights and the rule of law, they begin to travel the road to prosperity.